Hello, I'm Diana Reif, the Artistic Director of the Charleston Literary Festival. I'd like to welcome our speakers, audience and donors. If the past four to 18 months has taught us anything, it is that books and their authors, whether classical or contemporary, really matter. In trying times, readers turn to books for insights into the human condition, for the opportunity to be transported to other worlds, for ideas, for arguments, for inspiration, for experiencing the impossible, for laughter, and for the release of tears. The festival will provide the opportunity to engage with a galaxy of literary and artistic stars, as well as up and coming writers who are making waves. We have a far flung cast list featuring authors from all over the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Whether they're talking about former literary trailblazers or gene editing or human rights or popular culture or feminism or medieval nuns or groundbreaking films or innumerable other subjects, they have one thing in common, the ability of compelling stories to linger in our imaginations. We're grateful to all our speakers, whether virtual or in-person, for sharing their talents. Please thank them by purchasing their books. The festival couldn't happen without a committed team and a board. We would like to thank our donors, both private and public, who generously make the festival possible. The College of Charleston, our academic partner, has been an invaluable source of support. It is no accident that the festival takes place in Charleston, a prime destination with a progressive literary and artistic tradition. I hope that you enjoy all the events and that they make you think and dream afresh. Hello and welcome to the Charleston Literary Festival. As much as I love our virtual ses sessions and having people join from all over the world, there's just nothing better than being in front of a live audience. So thank you so much for being here. I'm Anne Blessing. I'm the secretary of the board of the Charleston Literary Festival and a longtime supporter, also a former English professor at Tulane and the College of Charleston, our academic partner. Recently, I taught high school English at Ashley Hall, and I'm currently um, on what my husband calls eternity leave. <laughs> but it is my great pleasure to be introducing this dynamic writer today, Jean Hamp Korlitz. Jean is the author of eight novels, nine if you count Crib, which is the novel that Jacob Finch Bonner writes within the plot. In addition, she has written a middle grade reader called Interference Powder, a theatrical adaptation of James Joyce's short story, The Dead, and a collection of poetry, The Properties of Breath. The plot is a New York Times bestseller called Insanely Readable by Stephen King and an addictive Russian nesting doll of a novel by the New York Times. Her novel, You Should Have Known, was adapted by David E. Kelly into the HBO series, The Undoing, starring Hugh Grant, Nicole Kidman, and Donald Sutherland. And her novel, Admission, was made into a film starring Tina Fey, Lily Tomlin, and Paul Rudd. Her most recent novel, The Latecomer, will be released in May 2022. Jean was born and raised in New York and educated at Dartmouth College and Clare College, Cambridge. She and her husband, the poet Paul Muldoon, have two children. On top of all of this, Jean has a company called Book the Writer, which hosts pop-up book groups in which small groups of readers discuss new books with their authors. Um, and before I sit down to converse with Jean, I'm just going to confess a fear on stage to the entire audience, and it's not stage fright. Um, my fear is giving away the spoilers, giving away the plot of the plot. So what um, Jean and I have to do today is talk about the plot of the plot without giving away the plot of the plot. <laughs> And um, she's a pro, she's been on stage a lot and been talking about this, this book all over the place. So I'm gonna ask her to interrupt me if I'm heading in that direction. But I'm also gonna ask that when we have questions at the end that those who ask also don't give away the plot of the plot. So, um, but before I 
sit down. I wanted to gauge our audience, and I can't really see you all, but I'm going to try. I wanted to know how many people in the audience have read the plot. They already know the spoilers. Okay, it looks like at least half. Um, how many of you have read, oh, thank you. How many of you have read You Should Have Known? How many of you have seen the series, The Undoing? A lot, okay. Well, you all have so much to look forward to. I hope you get to spend some time the way I have the last couple of weeks reading Jean's novels, and there are quite a few. So please, audience, join me in welcoming Jean Hanf Corlitz. Yeah, we should say that, yes, I've been talking about this book a lot, but this is the first time live. So, oh, I mean, what an honor. Yeah. Well, we are thrilled to be the ones with whom you do that. Um, so, Jean, I yeah. just, um, I thought it was so interesting that you began as a poet. Yep. And I wondered, how does a poet get to psychological thrillers. Um, and then I looked back at your history and saw that your first novel, A Jury of Her Peers, was also suspense, and that um, your character was called a post-feminist Nancy Drew. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> By a critic. I totally forgot that. Well, that's okay. Um, the answer to your question is very gr gradually and with many steps along the way over many years. I. I only wrote poetry through high school and in college and at Cambridge. Um, but the reason for that was really that um, I was afraid to write fiction. I was terrified, um, appropriately terrified. <laughs> I mean, it's, it really is scary. Um, I had this weird experience while I was at Cambridge. I, I heard about this essay that Donald Hall had written in uh, the Kenyan Review, and of course this was pre-internet because I'm extremely elderly. Um, it was 1983, and uh, you couldn't just look up this essay. So I went to the library and I got a copy of the Kenyan Review, and um, I read the essay. And basically this essay was very critical of the new Master of Fine Arts programs that were popping up all over America. Um, a theme I return to later in the plot. Um, but Donald Hall's criticism about these programs was that they were good at producing pretty good poets. And the problem with all of these pretty good poets was that it was more and more difficult to find the one or two person in each generation who was Keats. And therefore, would those of you who were pretty good poets and not Keats please stop writing. And people, people were furious about this. But I read it and I thought, you know what? I'm not Keats. I knew I wasn't Keats. And then I met Keats and I married Keats. <laughs> so I could see the difference between what I was doing and what my husband was doing. I did hang on long enough to, to put out one collection of poems. Um, but the longer impact of having begun as a poet is that I learned how to listen as a writer. And I still write with my ears open, and I can't leave an ugly sentence on the page, which is not to say that there aren't ugly sentences in my books, but I, they're not there with my knowledge. Um, I, I mean, I'm going through the final edits today. I was working on it today of the new book, and I'm still making changes because something is clunky or I use the same word two sentences in a row. That, I think, is what comes from the poetry. Well, and as far as all those other poets stepping aside, <laughs> one of the funniest parts of the book is Ripley College and this um, idea that anyone can be a writer. Yes. Everyone has a story to tell. Um, and you, Jake, even though he's teaching writers questions whether writing can be taught, um, or whether there's just, there's natural talent. What do you think? You know, I had this conversation recently with my husband who does teach creative writing. Um, and I, even after all these years of marriage, I was wrong with what I thought he was gonna say. I thought he was gonna agree with me that writing can't be taught. Um, he doesn't agree with that. He thinks that it can be taught in the same way that playing the violin can be taught or riding a horse can be taught. 
that you can be made better by instruction. But as far as being a great writer, um, I don't think so. I really don't think so. Well, one of, um, one of the um, things that your book read me, led me to was Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. And yeah, there's one part where no self-respecting writer mm -hmm. would not know the plot of the book. What is it that you love about that book? And what are, who are some of the other writers that you consider great writers? Housekeeping is an incredibly special book to me. It's one of my, I have a personal pantheon of six novels. I've loved many, many novels over the years and other kinds of books, but when it comes to novels, there are six that are like the angels floating around my head and Housekeeping is one of them. It is such an incredibly beautiful book that I've never been able to reread it, um, which I think it's the only one of the six that I've never reread. Uh, you know, it's about a, a, a young woman who grows up in uh, a little town in Idaho and her mother dies, and so a relative comes to care for her and her sibling, and this woman is, is barely capable of taking care of herself, let alone two little girls, and one of the little girls sort of begins to um, draw more towards uh, society and other people, and the other, the protagonist, the narrator, begins to draw more towards this caretaker. And it's, you know, it's a quiet book. It's not like so much happens. It's just unbelievably beautiful. And what are some of the others? Oh, you want to know the other, I, the rest? Well, yeah, <laughs> don't you? Doesn't everyone want to know the other it's, five? You know, it's, it's uh, okay. So I, I had four until about a year ago, and then I broke down and added two. So the original four, the OG, I guess. Um, Housekeeping, Pride and Prejudice, because duh. Um, a novel by Chaim Potok called My Name is Asher Lev, which is actually not a great novel, but it was an incredibly important novel to me. I named my son Asher after it. And um, The Wild Card, which is uh, Frederick Forsyth's uh, The Odessa File. And I, um, I'm very pugilistic in defense of the Odessa file. If anybody wants to fight with me about the Odessa file, see me later. Um, and <laughs> I then, do not. What? I do not want to fight you. It's such a great it is such a great book, and, and it's, it's a beautifully plotted book as well. Um, and, and so the, and the two that I added a couple years ago were Molly Keene's, uh, Molly Keene, great Irish novelist, her novel, uh, Good Behavior, which is just delicious, and um, a novel by Neville Shute, who uh, was a British writer who wrote mainly about Australia, um, called A Town Like Alice which is just spectacular. And also from a, from a writer's perspective, a really kind of rule-breaking novel. And when I reread it, it was even better. So read it and then read it again. <laughs> so those are the six. So as far as your writing life, there's, um, I love the way you describe Jake's writing life and he's really a failed writer. Yeah. And then he decides to do this, take the story, and then all of a sudden he's on stage in front of 2,400 people Just and he like has a, a New York Times um, yeah. bestseller. But yeah. was there a moment for you where you realized you've made it, you know, kind of like when Jake's on the stage <laughs> like that, where things changed? I still haven't realized it. I mean, so, okay, here's the thing that people often don't understand. Why should they? There, there is a reasonable assumption, I would think, that if somebody's had their book made into a movie or a TV show with Nicole Kidman in it, that they've become a successful writer. But I, um, that, you know, that wasn't really me. I mean, my big, my big litmus test for success was always to have somebody walk up to me who I didn't know and say, I know your work, and that had never happened. <laughs> <laughs> until this book and when it started to happen it was the most gratifying thing and and you know I've still never seen a stranger reading my book or anything like that believe me I've looked um, <laughs> but um, I've yet to see it in an airport you know oh god I, I'm gonna shut up it's, it just sounds really awful but but I you know with every novel there's been you know a period of excitement beforehand some more than others, uh, but inevitably after publication there would be this like, that, 
and uh, you know, somebody cleverer than I called it the calm before the calm, you know, the, the period before your book is published. This time it was different, it felt different. I didn't know if it was because I was really well published um, with this fantastic group of mainly young people at the publisher just knowing what to do with the internet, for example. But I became aware that people were reading the book and telling one another about the book and passing the book along and choosing it for their book groups. And it, it's just been incredibly exciting. Well, one of the parts I love about Jake is when he thinks he sees someone in public reading his book and then he gets closer and he realizes it's, it's someone else. It's another book that looks a little like his. Poor Jake, he just can't catch a break. I will say that, um, you know, if you really want to delve the, you know, into the sickening depths of writerly jealousy and failure, it's not this book. It's a novel by Martin Amos called The Information. That's if you really want to excavate the rotten tooth of how dark things get. You really want to punish yourself as a writer. Go pick up the information. Well, the way that Jake, um, you know, he, he knows he's doing something wrong when he uses this idea and he stews over it a little bit, but the way he justifies, is, justifies doing it is this idea that a writer has a higher aim and that aim mm -hmm. is an allegiance to a story, a story that must be told. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, I can actually read a few minutes of this. Um, I think that we would love for you okay, to read. Okay, so just to catch you up, if you and I'm not telling you anything now that isn't on the jacket copy of the book. Uh, Jake is, let's just call him a failed writer. I mean, he, he, wrote a, <laughs> he wrote a novel that got a teeny tiny bit of attention but he was barely able to write and publish a second book. And the third book, he can't even write. He's got nothing, he's tapped out. He's scratching a living from a uh, pretty bottom of the barrel MFA program called Ripley. No reference to Patricia Highsmith intended, of course. Um, and into his classroom walks the worst of all possible students, this arrogant guy called Evan Parker, and Evan basically says, I don't need y'all because I'm writing a foolproof book. I'm writing a book, a plot that is so great that um, it's going to be extremely successful. And Jake thinks, you know, what a jerk. You know, I've seen this guy before. I've actually confirmed that this guy is in every single creative writing class ever taught. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, but then what happens is that in a conference, not in front of other people, but in a conference, um, Jake actually does hear this plot and he is extremely chagrined to uh, note that this, it's absolutely true. This guy's, this guy's book is gonna be massively, massively successful. But, you know, there are rules about these things and he steps back and waits for this supernova publication to happen and it never happens. And one day he looks up his former student and he discovers that he's dead. And not just recently, he's been dead for a couple of years. He has never written, let alone published this book. That's where, um, that's where this excerpt begins, okay. Stories are maddeningly elusive. There's no deep mine of them to blast around in or big box store with wide aisles of unused, undreamed of, and thrillingly new narratives for a writer to push a big empty shopping cart through, waiting for something to catch their eye. But every now and then, some magical little spark flew up out of nowhere and landed in the consciousness of a person capable of bringing it to life. This was occasionally called inspiration, though inspiration was not a word writers themselves often used. Those magical little sparks tended not to waste time in declaring themselves. They woke you up in the mornings with an annoying tap-tap and a sense of unfolding urgency, and they hounded you through the days that followed. The idea, the characters, the problem, the setting, lines of dialogue, descriptive phrases, an opening sentence. To Jake, the word that comprised the relationship between a writer and their spark was responsibility. Once you were in possession of an actual idea, you owed it a debt for having chosen you and not some other writer. And you paid that debt by getting down to work, 
not just as a journeyman fabricator of sentences, but as an unshrinking artist ready to make painful, time-consuming, even self-flagellating mistakes. Rising to this responsibility was a matter of facing your blank page or screen and muzzling the critics inside your head, at least long enough for you to get some work done, all of which was profoundly difficult and none of which was optional. What's more, you stepped away from it at your peril because if you failed in this grave responsibility, you might well find after some period of distraction or even less than fully committed work that your precious spark had left you. Gone, in other words, as suddenly and unexpectedly as it had appeared and your novel along with it, though you might spin your wheels for a few months or a few years or the rest of your life, hopelessly throwing words onto the page in a stubborn refusal to face what had happened. And there was something else an extra dark superstition for any writer hubristic enough to ignore the spark of a great idea, even if that writer was not of a religious bent, even if he did not believe that everything happens for a reason, even if indeed he resisted magical thinking of every other conceivable kind. The superstition held that if you did not do right by the magnificent idea that had chosen you among all possible writers to bring it to life, that great idea didn't just leave you to spin your stupid and ineffectual wheels, it actually went to somebody else. A great story, in other words, wanted to be told. And if you weren't going to tell it, it was out of here. It was going to find another writer who would, and you would be reduced to watching somebody else write and publish your book. Once long ago, Jake had done his best to honor what he'd been given he had recognized his spark and done right by it, never shirking the hard thinking and the careful writing, pushing himself to do well and then to do better. He had pursued no shortcuts and evaded no effort. He had taken his chance against the world, submitting himself to the opinions of publishers, reviewers, and ordinary readers. But favor had passed over him and moved on to others. What was he to do? Who was he to be if no other spark ever came to him again? It was unbearable to contemplate. Good writers borrow, great writers steal, Jake was thinking. That ubiquitous phrase was attributed to T.S. Eliot, which didn't mean Eliot hadn't stolen it himself. But Eliot had been talking perhaps less than seriously about the theft of actual language, phrases and sentences and paragraphs, not of a story itself. Besides, Jake knew, as Eliot had known, as all artists ought to know, that every story, like every single work of art, from the cave paintings to whatever was playing at the Park Theater in Cobleskill, to his own puny books, was in conversation with every other work of art, bouncing against its predecessors, drawing from its contemporaries, harmonizing with the patterns. All of it, paintings and choreography and poetry and photography and performance art and the ever-fluctuating novel was whirling away in an unstoppable spin art machine of its own. He would hardly be the first to take some tale from a play or a book, in this case, a book that had never been written, and create something entirely new from it. Miss Saigon from Madame Butterfly, The Hours from Mrs. Dalloway, The Lion King from Hamlet, for goodness sake. It wasn't even taboo, and obviously it wasn't theft. Even if Parker's manuscript actually existed at the time of his death, Jake had never seen more than a couple of pages of the thing, and he remembered little of what he had seen. Surely, what he himself might make from so little would belong to him, and only to him. He hadn't gone looking for this. He had upheld the honor of writers who listened to the ideas of other writers and then turned responsibly back to their own. He had absolutely not invited the brilliant spark his student had abandoned, okay, involuntarily abandoned, to come to him. But come it had, and here it was. This urgent, shimmering thing, already tap-tapping in his head, already hounding him, the idea, the characters, the problem. So what was Jake going to do about that? A rhetorical question, obviously. He knew exactly what he was going to do about that.
So I love what you then go on and do with that because you have the pages that the reader gets to read that are written by mm -hmm. Evan Parker, also known as Parker Evan, because mm -hmm. Evan's already decided his pen name because he knows he's already going to be famous. Right. Um, and I think he was in my creative writing class, by the way. Yeah, of course. He was. He was. <laughs> and I, he was probably in a lot of yours, too. So, so you take those pages. So the reader, we get to see what Evan Parker wrote. Mm -hmm. But then, as you say, Jake doesn't use any of his words, but he takes the story. And then you end up putting Jake's novel within, and the two stories merge. Right. How, did, how did you decide to do How did that work? Well, I, I didn't decide to do it. I tried to get out of doing it, actually. I was terrified of doing it. Um, uh, and, and while I was writing the book, I happened to hear a, uh, an interview with Lily King about her novel, Writers and Lovers, which is also about a woman writing a novel which becomes successful. Um, and the interviewer said to her, well, you know, did you think of giving us a little taste of, your, of the book that your protagonist is writing? And she said, I felt that whatever I, I offered the reader wouldn't be good enough to justify all of the publishing excitement in the novel. And I thought, awesome. <laughs> she doesn't have to do it. I don't have to do it either. And when I turned in the plot to my editor, um, it didn't have any of those chapters. And my editor called me and said, weren't you gonna like give us the novel? And I said, yeah, but Lily King's not doing hers, so I don't have to do mine. And she's like, yeah, you have to do it. So then I had to go back and write all of those chapters. Of course, it was the right thing to do because, well, first of all, they're clues, right? And, um, and I, I think I also wanted to, I wanted to reassure my reader that Jake actually is a good writer. I mean, he's not, he's not only his darker uh, tendencies. How did you differentiate his voice from your voice? With difficulty. I mean, I'm, I'm, thank you for implying that I did because it was a big, <laughs> it was a big problem. Um, I, I think they, I think they're probably pretty close, but I did, I did my best to, to just tweak them a little bit to make them a little bit different. Well, I was going to ask you about, this is your first male protagonist. It, it almost is. I, I, one of my novels, The White Rose, has three protagonists and one of them is a man, but you're right, it is my first all boy. And how is that different? It wasn't that different, and, and I didn't kind of overthink it. I mean, I just always saw the character as this guy. Um, as, and I think one of the reasons why the book has been, you know, uh, taken to the, the breast of writers is that it, it really is about us, and it's, it's about our, our pettiness and our jealousy and our narcissism, and, um, but also, I mean, the, the, the one really nice thing about Jake, the one thing that I admire about him, is he doesn't blame anybody else for his failure. He blames himself for not writing a good enough book. He doesn't, you know, he has no paranoia about, you know, people not liking him or because he's a white man or anything like that. He just, he knows it's because he hasn't written a good enough book until he does. So it, it wasn't that hard. Well, I love the way at the end you have a chapter called A Writer's Eye for Detail. And I love the way Jake is a writer and so detailed, and yet he misses some things that are just right under his nose, which is <laughs> a little bit like Grace in You Should Have Known. Yeah. Um, and maybe you can just, for those who haven't read, just talk a little bit about, about Well, her. I mean, th this is something that I come back to again and again, how smart people can be so stupid, I guess. Um, my mom was a therapist, and she used to um, talk to me and my sister a lot about, I mean, not, nothing specific, no details. We didn't know the names of her patients or anything like that. But she would come home and say, you know, I have this brilliant client who is a CEO, and she went to Harvard, and she's got 800 people working under her, and, you know, and there's this person in her life who's cheating on her, you know, harming her, or hitting her, or stealing from her. And how can she be so brilliant and so 
unseen at the same time. I think she felt that the more of these cautionary tales we heard, the more suspicious and careful we would be. So uh, that, I mean, that kind of juxtaposition of competence and ignorance uh, went right into, you know, you should have known. That was the question at the center of you should have known, which is quite different from the undoing for those of you who only saw the undoing. <laughs> Well, I wanted to ask you about adaptation because I know you've done a good bit of adaptation yourself with um, some reference to The Scarlet Letter in one of your earlier right, yeah. novels Thanks and then De Rosen Cavalier with The White That's Rose, which right. I haven't finished. That's why I didn't know there was a male protagonist. But I wondered, you now have had two novels adapted into films, and I wondered, even though you agreed to that, did it feel at all like your story was being stolen the way... Stolen Jake isn't the right steals. word, but you're <laughs> the first time was admission, and I vividly remember the day I was sent the script, and I really liked the screenwriter. We're still friends. I mean, that was one of the nicest things that came out of that movie. Um, and we had had lunch, and we, you know, we were exactly the same age, and we had kids exactly the same age, and our politics were the same, and we really liked each other. And she said, you know, this is gonna be hard for you. And I was like, nah. <laughs> and when I read the script, I, I, I had to lie down. I mean, it was so devastating. And, and that, was, that was not nearly as different as, as the, um, you know, you should have known to the undoing. But by then, I had learned to let go. So I had like, whatever kind of thing, you know, it's David E. Kelly, whatever. Um, but he had said to me at the outset, I'm going in a different direction. Um, I'm, it's going to be more of a whodunit. And I was like, you're David E. Kelly. You do whatever you want to do. And I didn't know who did it in the undoing. I mean, my husband and I were sitting there on the last night with everybody else going like, who did it? Who is it? Who did it? Um, I thought it was the friend. I mean, that's how out of it I was. Oops, sorry. I did like <laughs> that Grace took an active role. I thought that, you know, it, it showed her brilliance that she was controlling things. Well, in the novel, it's all about Grace. It's really, it, it's about somebody who is so together and so, uh, so confident in her ideas that she actually writes a book called You Should Have Known. She's about to go on a book tour when her husband disappears. So all of that was gone from, from the adaptation. But it's still there in the book, and that's the part. And I the book is great. I loved it. Thanks. Um, so did you get to meet Nicole Kidman and Hugh Grant? I did. I did, actually. I, I, I told this story to Hugh Grant, but then I told it to him again because he forgot it the first time. Um, I don't think it's a very important story to him, but many, many years ago, I was at Oxford for a semester, and one day, somebody said to me, do you want to be in a movie? And I was like, yeah. So I was told to put on my nicest dress and go to Rhodes House, which is where the Rhodes Scholars hang out in Oxford, and I got there, and they were filming this party scene, and it was a film. It was Hugh Grant's first film. Um, it was called Privileged. And he played this aristocratic student. And, you know, my role was to dance at this party. Like, it was not an important role. So I'm dancing at the party, and into the room comes this beautiful, beautiful boy. What was he, 19 then? And he walks across to his uh, antagonist, who's this other beautiful boy, but not as beautiful as Hugh Grant. And he opens up this box with these dueling pistols in it. And he says to the other guy, sir, I demand satisfaction, which is a line that you don't forget. You know? <laughs> and I, so when I met Hugh Grant, I said, I was, I was in that scene. You know? I, I saw you. I was dancing. You know? And... Uh, then I told him again because he forgot it the first time. So, uh, <laughs> so it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't as important to him as it was to me. But um, yes, I had met you, Grant, before. Well, your books are so entertaining. Um, and one thing I was trying to find if, if there was something in common. I noticed Chicken Marbala is in, mentioned yeah, in a couple of Yeah, that was like them, my Cornetto. You know, the Edgar Wright, the British, the British filmmaker, he puts a Cornetto at every, <laughs> in every one of his movies. Well, never, it was a good one because I have happy memories of that, too. Yeah. Um, but I, I wondered, you know, you kind of, of course, present a dilemma in each one. But do you see as a body of work something that you do, that you try to do each time? 
I didn't see it as I was writing them. I've seen them in retrospect. It's like, you know, that Kierkegaard quote, life can only be understood backwards, but it has to be lived forwards. I see looking back at these really different books, that I see a couple of things. First of all, I, I must love academic settings. I love colleges. And I think, you know, I've written The Devil and Webster, uh, Admission, this one, the new one, uh, the latecomer, all have these academic settings. And I think the reason for that is that people at colleges are talking about ideas. And I've never worked in an office except for one year in publishing. For all I know, they could be talking about ideas all the time. <laughs> but I don't know about that. I know about universities because I'm a faculty spouse and I have been for 30 years. So I've watched a whole generation of students go by. And I, I really love that. So academic settings, leaving home, the idea of kids leaving home with or without college admissions, which I'm obviously obsessed with. But I think the most important um, common denominator, the one I see the most clearly, is liars. I am obsessed with liars. Um, and it may be because I'm a crappy liar myself. Um, it's something I'm really bad at. Uh, I have a really bad kind of super ego, you know, guilt thing. Um, people who lie and then blithely go along their way are fascinating to me, and they always have been, and I'm, they always will be. And yes, it has been an interesting few years. That's all I'll say. It's been a really interesting few years. Well, I love The Devil and Webster, which is an academic setting and has a plagiarist Yep. and a liar who gets lots of national media mm -hmm. uh, attention, and mm -hmm. that was a great one. But I also loved admission because for a, a lot of reasons. Um, I love, you know, that age as well. I've helped kids write. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you have too. You got interested in helping or reading admission letters partly as <laughs> research for the book, but then just because you loved it. And how yeah, do you have I'm, time to do that? I don't know. I, I, I'm actually still doing it. I, I freelance for a college counselor uh, in Connecticut, a very principled college counselor. She's not Rick Singer. She doesn't take money from, you know, there's no side door with her. In fact, you know, College of Charleston is, is I've, I've helped her students with essays to the College of Charleston. This is a popular choice. We know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do not write their essays. I help them rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. But I love it because to read these applications, which I did for Princeton for two years, is to see is to have hope in the future. And I'm I, I get very worried about the future. So when I read you know, and obviously these kids are putting their best feet forward. They're they're presenting themselves in the best possible way. Of course they are. But to see this generation coming up, to see how, how they think globally, they act locally, they're pissed off in all of the right ways, they're full of ideas about how to fix things. You know, it, it is to have one's faith restored. So I'm doing it, you know, for myself, to give myself a little jolt of optimism. But, um, you know, it, it, you know, when people reach out for education, wherever they're reaching from, it's, it's, it's always a good thing, so. I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm gonna let some audience members have a chance. Okay. But um, I, I was thinking when we were gonna do this that you're an interesting person to interview for a variety of reasons. First of all, I could end up as a character in one of your books if I <laughs> say something crazy. But also, you have interviewed so many writers because you have a company in your right. spare time. You have a, a, a company for creating these um, opportunities for mm -hmm. book clubs to interact with writers. Right. What do you think it is that makes people like us want to know the writer? That's a great question. I, I have observed that at, well, first of all, the, the, the company, I say company as if it's making me scads of money, it's not. Um, but it is a company. Um, it's called Book the Writer, and it came out of a book group that I uh, ran for years when I lived in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, I ran it as a, as a charity, as a fundraiser for a charity. Um, now it's a business. Uh, but the idea of it was you, you 
read the book and you gather and there's the author and you have this conversation with the author. When I moved back to New York uh, about eight years ago, I decided to see if it could be a business and uh, it, it was great for about um, you know five years. Then we had this pandemic, maybe you heard about that. And then we went online, um, which I resisted. I, I wanted to wait till we could all be back in the room together. But people were, were begging me, you know, we really want to gather, we really want to have these conversations again. So we were online for about a year and a half. And now we're back in rooms, but with an online element. So anybody can buy a ticket and come to these and you can, you know, have these conversations with these authors. We've had amazing authors. You guys just missed Juliana Margulies. That was fun. Um, our next author is on Monday, it's Russell Banks, and you know, we've got a lot of Jimpal Heary coming up and Chang Ray Lee, anyway. Um, but why do people want to ask? Okay, I have observed that in every session of Book the Writer, some form of the same question has been asked. And the question is, did you know when you began and, and weirdly, this is true whether it's fiction, whether it's nonfiction, and whether it's a memoir where you would think the author would know, what, you know where they were going. Did you know that this was gonna happen in your book? And the answer is always no. And this is so fascinating to readers because you know when you read, you open a book, everything is like, it's black and white. It's set in stone. It, it, it has to be that way but the process of getting the words on the page is so fraught and so malleable, and it's a process of discovery, and it could go either way. Um, so I would like, wait, you know, like in Sex in the City, where you're always waiting for the question, I couldn't help but wonder. <laughs> it, it was, it's been like that for me in every single meeting of, of our Book the Writer events. I'm waiting for somebody to say, it happened the other night, it was crazy. Um, we, with, we had Alexander Andrews who wrote, um, uh, who is Maude Dixon? Did you know that that was going to happen? I'm like, yep. Yeah. The answer is no. The answer is always no. <laughs> okay. Well, if they don't have questions, I still have quite a few more. But um, I'm going to ask, there's going to be a mic that's passed around. If you have a question, would you mind keeping your mask on, but stand up so that um, we can see you and also um, she can see you with the mic. Here we see anybody. Yeah. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. This is not very esoteric, but I grew up in Athens, Georgia, and my jaw dropped when you took the action from the original location to Athens, Georgia. So I was just curious what your connection was with that town because you seemed to know it. Uh, well, I've been there. Um, Were you in taking classes? No, no, I no. was visiting. Uh, my husband was doing something there, and I have an old friend from New Jersey who moved down there with her husband who does work for the university. And then later, just, you know, the plot led me there. I, I can't, I don't want to go into too many details, but the really weird thing was that during the pandemic, uh, when I was upstairs writing this book, my husband uh, was doing had two projects. One was this little book he just wrote with Paul McCartney, which came out this week, um, called The Lyrics, and the other was a musical set in Athens, Georgia. And the weird thing is that we were both writing about Athens, Georgia <laughs> at the same time. His, his musical is actually called Athens, Georgia. <laughs> so um, that was very weird. But I needed a university town. I needed a big university where somebody could get lost. And uh, preferably it should be in a distant part of the country from where some of the other action takes place. And really because I had been there not too long before and I, and I remembered how things had looked and smelled and tasted and because and, I also had a friend who lived there who I could ask some questions of, it was, it was the obvious place. So. I had to put the mask down. Um, you mentioned Donald Hall, who was really a great poet and also a prose writer. Um, do you see yourself ever going back to poetry and 
Do you think that being a poet originally led you to be a better prose writer? No and yes. I mean, no, I'm not going back. <laughs> the world of poetry is going to do just fine without me. Um, yes, absolutely. It, 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 writing poetry teaches you to listen. And, you know, I, I, I still, I can't, I can't write a sentence that is ugly. I mean, I'm sure I've done it a lot, but I can't leave it on the page if it's ugly. I have to fix it and fix it and fix it. So, yeah, but uh, just in case you, you know, uh, imagine that I went straight from poetry to plot-driven fiction, no. I wrote two deeply poetic, unreadable novels in which nothing happened, and no one ever published them, and nobody ever will. So, I mean, there, when I say that there were, like, steps along the way, there were unsuccessful books that were a little too much about the, the beautiful lyrical writing and not enough about things actually happening. So I learned from that too. There's a question. Okay, since you mentioned your husband's writing a book with Paul McCartney, did you get to meet him? I did get to meet him, oh. uh, yeah. Well, you know, just today, I mean, Literally an hour before I came here, I was in my hotel watching the live stream from London of the two of them at the Royal Festival Hall. You can probably watch it on YouTube, I don't know. Um, but yeah, they've, their book came out this week. Last time I checked, it was number seven on Amazon. I guess that's good. Uh, wow. Um, yeah. Well, if you see him again, tell him I said hi. Um, <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so the qu actual question is, um, and I hope it's not the same form of the question that you mentioned that, that you, you get in every one of your talks. Does it start is, with, did, did, did you, you know? know? <laughs> my, my question is more about, um, I'm often disappointed in endings, and with, in books and in movies. And I, I thought of this because in The Undoing, I was disappointed in the end. I knew who did it. Not responsible. Okay. I'm not responsible. <laughs> I, know, I knew who did it, and I thought the end, the last couple of scenes, you know, were really bad. Not as bad as the whole last season of Game of Thrones, but I, I know that it's very, very difficult to, to write an ending, and that, so I wanted to ask you about writing endings, and um, secondly, about how do you know you're finished, because you said you, you write and you write and you write and you fix and you fix and you fix, and so does knowing when you're finished have anything to do with actually writing the ending? Does, um, that's a lot of questions. The excerpt that I read has scribbles on it. You know why? Because I've changed things since this book came out. So, <laughs> you know, I hope it's finished now. But as far as the endings, listen, I, you know, I don't, it was a different animal, the undoing was a different animal. I, I, I got this kind of snarky email through my uh, website. And somebody said, why was Nicole walking around Harlem in the middle of the night? I don't know. It's not in my book, you know. I, I would like to know the answer to that myself. But um, you should read the book. I will say <laughs> that I loved the series too, but you miss all those nuances of New York that you capture so well, yeah. and the, the characters are just... Yeah, and bear in mind also, in my book, these characters are A, all Jewish, and B, they're not that rich. In fact, the, the fact that they're not that rich is a big deal in mm -hmm. the world that they live in. So somehow the rich the, New York people are scarier than <laughs> the murderers. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, so there, there's a lot that's different. Um, I feel like I haven't answered your question though. Endings, endings are really hard. There's a, um, this is the right ending. There's a question here. She's coming, she's coming. First of all, this is a tour de force, so big congratulations Thank on you. this book. You will not be able to put it down, honestly. Uh, so my question is about the ethics of literary appropriation and whether any of your views changed as you wrote the book. Because I'm thinking about Romana Kless. I mean, think about it, you know? Yeah. People steal from their lives. They steal from other people. It just happens, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, the, 
everything is okay until you're cutting and pasting somebody else's language. If you, if you steal somebody's language, you should be drawn and quartered. Your head should be you know, on a spike in front of the public library. Oh, yeah. um, there's, <laughs> however, I, I want to maybe soften that a little bit by saying this one other thing, which is that one of the reasons that we writers are so obsessed with plagiarism, of course, we are worried that somebody will do it to us. But deep down, I think we have a real fear that we're doing it ourselves without our own knowledge. And how can that be? That can be because we are readers and we've been reading for years and we, you know, we read under the sheets and we had books read to us and we, you know, we've read on the beach and we, you know, we have good books, bad books. It's all in there and it's all churning around. And sometimes when we're writing, there's this kind of very worrying feeling of familiarity and you're going, did I just write that or did I read that somewhere? And you can, can't know for sure. And I think we all have this kind of fear that somebody's gonna come out of the woodwork and say, jacuzzi, just like it happens to Jake. So, you know, Jake knows that what he did isn't wrong. He didn't copy anything. He took, he took an idea that somebody couldn't use. It wanted to be told. He didn't take a single phrase, a single sentence. His fear is not, uh, you know, that he'll be uncovered as having done a bad thing. His fear is that people who don't understand that will accuse him anyway. I mean, I, I think in these moments of, you know, James Fry, not a guy I would ordinar ordinarily go to the mat for, but that's a guy who stole from himself and he still got ripped to shreds. Um, and we all condemned him. That's what Jake's afraid of. He's afraid of the career ending, the uh, livelihood ending, the ability to hold his head up in public ending. You know, it could all come tearing down with the disapproval of readers. Thank you. We have shame culture. <laughs> shame culture, yeah. You're right. Thanks yeah. a lot. Any other questions? There's one up here. Hi, um, I'm, I'm, I can't believe that you do college admissions letters, and I, half of me wonders, you know, did their parents know who their kid was talking to? <laughs> and the uh, second question is, because you're interested and fascinated with liars, were any of the students ever liars? Did you ever have to talk somebody off of what they were saying in their letter? <laughs> You mean the, the applicants that, whose essays I have worked with them on? Yes, exactly. Did you ever have one that wasn't talking about saving the world or, you know, and you've had no. to dig deeper? I, I, I will tell you, this isn't a, an essay that I worked, in, uh, that I worked on, but um, years ago when I was reading applications for Princeton, I read that this is, this is not an answer to your question, but I'm going to gift you with this amazing <laughs> essay. This was the, my favorite essay of the thousands that I read. I, by the way, I don't even know if he got in. Um, he was from the Bay Area, and he started his essay by saying that he had been a punk, like, you know, thing through the nose and the mohawk and the tattoos and all of that. And this was his persona all through high school. He was a punk. And one day, he realized that he didn't know what that meant. So he took himself on this kind of autodidactic journey back farther and farther and farther, you know, from punk to rock to rockabilly, you know, back and back and back and back and back, reading literature and listening to music. And, um, and finally, at the end of the day, he realized he wasn't a punk. He was a beat. <laughs> and, you know, he, this kid, I mean, he wasn't saving the world. It wasn't about the whales or, you know, the community even. He was saying, I, I had this kind of teenage arrogance and like, 
I was living the dream of this kind of shallow little idea, and then I realized that wasn't enough. I had to find out, and then I had to find out more, and then I had to find out more. And you look at a kid like that, and you think, this is the kid who's gonna make every classroom better. This is the kid somebody's gonna be so lucky to have as a roommate. And that, to me, was just the greatest college application essay I'd ever read. Thank you. But I don't, I don't know, if, I don't think they're lying. I mean, it's not my problem if they do. <laughs> One quick question we have. We did start a little late, so one more. Okay. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you for writing a magnificent book. Um, in thinking about your list of authors, one of them was Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. And I've often wondered with the 19th century and before and even maybe first well, 70 years of the 20th century, the craft of writing has really changed in that they didn't have word processors. Yeah. They didn't... They didn't have, as you mentioned, workshops. Um, I think they didn't have, you know, teams of editors and someone to come up with a, a better name and so forth. And I'm wondering what your reflections are about who some of those 19th century authors might have been in the current era. Would something have been lost had they had all of those Such seeming advantages question. that we have? Well, I mean, when in my brief flirtation with academia, 18th century fiction was my field. Jane Austen is a goddess. Um, the fact that she didn't have the keyboard, and I couldn't have been a, I couldn't have become a writer without the keyboard. My, first of all, I was put at the bad writer's table in first grade, and my handwriting is still bad, um, really bad. You know, the novel is called the novel because it was new. It was new in the 18th century. It's a baby art form. It hasn't been around that long. And look at all the changes that have happened just in the brief time it's been with us. Right now, it's changing before our eyes. There's this whole metafiction thing that's going on. I don't particularly enjoy it, but I'm, I'm reading it because I'm, I'm interested in where the novel is going. Um, it was also very much a female art form. Women read them and some women wrote them. So I'm sure there were many lost writers. Um, one writer I was interested in at, um, at Cambridge was a woman named Charlotte Lennox, who uh, wrote four novels in her lifetime and died absolutely penniless and in obscurity. Um, but one of her, her best known novel was called The Female Quicksup. And um, it was one of the many responses to Don Quixote, which uh, had reached England and people went crazy writing these responses to it. So hers, and, and her novel was a precursor, I mean, was a novel that uh, Jane Austen read in her childhood. So it, she may have disappeared, but she lives on in, you know, Sense and Sensibility and Northanger Abbey. Those are directly, um, they owe something uh, very much to Charlotte Lennox. So plenty, plenty of lost, lost writers out there. And I see College of Charleston professors here can, can elaborate on that, but we're gonna have to stop, unfortunately. I'm gonna ask the audience to please stay seated because Jean's gonna walk through to the back and sign books. Great. But before she does that, I'd just like to say this has been such a great conversation and I wish it could go on, but please join me in thanking Jean for joining us for the Charleston. Thanks, Ann. And thank you. That was great.